trigger warning. If you're not used to having your long-held religious, spiritual, and cultural beliefs challenged by what the Word of God actually says, brace yourself. In today's Torah portion, Ki Tesseh, we find out about holy cows. Stay tuned. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. Dimension as vast as space and time, as vast as the spirit of the living God. In the middle ground between this is light and shadow, truth and a lie. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerazim. Between this is science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his hopes in God. This is a dimension of imagination. It's an area in which we call the Torah. No. Hey, shalom, we my most excellent homies. Welcome back to another episode of The Torah Zone. Today, we're going over the Torah portion, Ki Teset. Ki Teset means when you take or when you elevate. Hebrew has multiple meanings to its words and are nuanced, depending on the context. So, <clears throat> Ki Teset is, it starts off talking about when you take a census. Now, God doesn't do things the way the world does. He has his own way of doing things. If you haven't noticed, he's good at that. So as we get into this portion of scripture, I want you to think about several different important factors. So the most important thing we start with, which I usually try to give my, uh, my, uh, um, my trigger warning, my trigger warning is this. If you're not used to having your long-held religious and cultural beliefs challenged by what the word of God actually says, brace yourself, hang on. <clears throat> because sometimes we believe something about the scriptures that the scriptures don't say either because of church history or traditions passed down. <clears throat> so what I want to delve into is some things that are going to challenge you a little bit, make you think, make you pray, make you seek God. Uh, and that's the important part about God's Word. It's supposed to test us. It's supposed to cause us to examine our own hearts and see if we're willing to obey and understand what our Heavenly Father is trying to teach us. So in this Torah portion, it starts off in Exodus, which is Shemot, means names in Hebrew, Shemot uh, chapter 30, verse 11. And it goes to chapter 34, verse 35. And we'll start with the scripture here, uh, 30, verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, when you take a census of the people of Israel and register them, each upon registration, is to pay a ransom, kofar in Hebrew. Pay a ransom, what a strange idea, uh, for his life to the Lord, to avoid any breakout of a plague among them during the time of the census. Now we see later in the Bible, King David takes a census without consulting with the Lord, and a plague breaks out, and a lot of people get sick and die. Not a smart thing to do. For some reason, God has his own rules and his own way of operating. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He wants us to conform to him. He doesn't want us to demand that he conform to us. And that's what this whole Torah portion is about. Are you going to follow God's ways and conform to his ways, or are you going to demand that he conforms to your ways? Guess what? There's a penalty attached to asking God to conform to your ways. And there's a reward attached to conforming your ways to his ways. This is fascinating. So, in the taking of a census, uh, each person is to pay a half shekel. Everyone subject to the census, who is over the age of 20 years old, is to con contribute a half shekel, which is one-fifth of an ounce of silver, by the standard uh, sanctuary shekel. Um, everyone over 20 years of age who is subject to the census is to give this offering to the Lord. The rich are not to give more, and the poor are not to give less than half a shekel. What is the lesson in this? The lesson in this is quite simple. God doesn't care how rich or poor you are. God treats everyone the same. Justice, honesty, equity, God wants us to make sure the playing field is level for everyone. And in taking a census, if the rich were to contribute more, that wouldn't give them an accurate count of the census. If the poor were to contribute less, that wouldn't give an accurate account. So God is saying, in my kingdom, Everybody's the same. There's no rich, there's no poor, there's no male, there's no female, and eventually God brings it to the point where there's no Jew and no Gentile. All are one before the Lord. So they're to contribute a half shekel, uh, to a, and it's to atone or to cover for their lives. You are to take the atonement money from the people of Israel and use it 
for the service of the tent of meeting, the Mishkan, the mobile temple, so that it will be a reminder of the people of Israel before the Lord is to atone for your lives. So that's the temple tax. It talks about that in the Gospels. Peter was supposed to pay his temple tax. Yeshua said, go down, throw a line in the water, and there'll be a fish with the coin in its mouth for you to pay a temple tax for you and for myself. So God provides it. We give to the service of the temple. Now, is this compared to the tithe? No, that's a whole different thing. This is for taking a census of the Israelites. And then we jump down to verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, you are to make a basin of bronze with the base of bronze for washing, place it between the tent of the meeting and the altar, and put water in it. Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and their feet when they enter the tent and the meeting, and they're to wash with water so that they won't die. <laughs> okay, that's kind of an important rule. Why are they supposed to wash? So they don't die. <laughs> All right, I guess I can do that. We can pay attention to that. Now, does that apply to us? No, we're not temple Levites. We're not going into the priesthood. We're not going into the temple. But is it important idea to wash your hands and feet? Yeah, that's a great thing to do. Do it often, will you? Uh, so you won't die. They're to wash your hands and feet. This is to be a perpetual law for them through all their generations. Interesting. It makes a point to say a perpetual law through all generations. What does perpetual mean? That means forever. That means for as long as humanity exists, God wants this to take place in the temple. Why is it important? God doesn't explain. It's important for us to observe the spirit of the Torah as opposed to the letter of the Torah. The spirit of the law is... <clears throat> it's important to wash and cleanse ourselves. The Lord heals us and redeems us from our sins, brings us to a life of being born again, filled with His Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but from time to time, we still need to wash our hands. Why our hands? They represent the hands of God in our lives, the hands of Jesus touching people. Why our feet? Because sometimes we've got to walk through a bunch of muck. We've got to walk through a bunch of sin and heartache and sorrow. And by cleansing our feet, the scripture says later in Joshua, every place on which your foot shall tread, I've given it to you. So our feet take us to God's purposes in our lives. Our hands represent touching God, touching people in the name of God for his purposes in his kingdom. We need to wash them regularly. The Lord said to Moses, take the best spices and they make a special holy anointing oil. And he gives them the ingredients for making this oil. And then he says down in verse 20, 30, I should say, all the utensils are supposed to be anointed with this specific oil, and it's a holy oil only for use to consecrate the priesthood and the utensils in the temple. And he says, you are to anoint Aaron and his sons, and you are to consecrate them to serve me in the office of Cohen, which is the priest. Tell the people of Israel, this is to be a holy anointing oil for me through all your generations. Now, here's an important uh caveat to that. It's not to be used for anointing a person's body. In other words, for perfume. So if you got a little bit of bad odor, you're not supposed to just use it to make yourself smell good. And you're not to make any like it with the same composition of ingredients. It is holy and you are to treat it as holy. Holy means set apart for a specific purpose, not for any other purpose. Whoever makes any like it or uses it in an unauthorized person is to be cut off from his people. Now, there was a guy on Facebook. He claims to be a rabbi, a messianic rabbi. Uh, I don't remember his name. It's probably important. I don't remember it and don't repeat it because it's a silly thing. He was literally selling this oil for people, saying God told him it was okay for him to break the command and now sell it to you for $20 an ounce so you could anoint yourself with this special holy anointing oil. First of all, that's um, what we used to call a snake oil salesman. That's taking the things of God and finding a way to make money off of it. That's, to me, like money changers in the temple. And this gentleman claims to be a Messianic rabbi, a Jewish person by heritage, despite what the scripture says, decided to make some of himself, and you could order it now on sale for $20 an ounce. It used to be $40, but today, and today only, such a deal, and you can pray and anoint yourself with this oil. God said it was okay. No, God didn't say it was okay. Follow God's instructions. Don't buy oil from some goofy rabbi who claims to be a believer on Facebook or any other place. Follow God's word. Don't listen to foolish teachings by foolish men. Men always want to add to and take away from God's word. Let's do our best to follow the spirit of the law and make sure we're obedient to his commands. And if you have bought some of that goofy oil, get rid of it. Just get rid of it. Uh, don't indulge in such foolishness. 
Now, is it important for us to pray for people, lay hands on them, and anoint them with oil? Yes, definitely, but not the oil that's specially formulated for use in the temple only. Don't profane the things of God. The Lord says to Moses, take this uh, aromatic plant substance, and he goes through the ingredients. You're not to make it your own and any incense like it. Whoever makes up any like it, he's repeating himself again. Whoever makes up anything like it to use as a perfume is to be cut off from his people. So when we come back, we're going to jump into the next portion where we begin to talk about Bitzarel uh, and Ojevial. That's really cool. See you back in just a moment. Shalom Aleichem. So when we come back, we're going to go into something very interesting about what the sin offering represents and Jesus, how he was not made in, unclean by the woman with the issue of blood and the little girl that he raised from the dead. It's fascinating. You'll be thrilled. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with the Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. Hey, if you've been inspired by our teaching, if you find this interesting and fascinating and want to help support the Wild Branch Ministries as we reach out to people across the globe, I would like for you to buy me a cup of coffee, a digital cup of coffee. So it's a digital cup of Joe. Just scan this QR code right here and buy me a cup of coffee and help support the outreach of the Wild Branch Ministry. Have a blessed day. Hey, welcome back. Shalom, my most excellent homies. <clears throat> We're jumping into chapter 31 of Exodus. Now, what I'd like to remind you is my goal in doing these teachings is to give you a bit of a Hebraic Jewish flavor for something that we don't have often in the evangelical Christian church. And we need to remember some of these principles that are lost over time because we got so far away from the true Hebraic roots of our faith. So let's get back into what God wants us to understand from a very Jewish Hebraic perspective. Chapter 31. This is powerful. The Lord said to Moses, I have singled out Bitzalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, uh, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, which is Chochmah, with understanding, which is Bina, and with knowledge, which is Da'at concerning every kind of artistry. And he is a master designer in gold, silver, and bronze, which to me parallel uh, wisdom, chokhmah, bina, understanding, and knowledge, which is da'at. Those are the Hebrew words for those three words. They're used throughout the scriptures many, many, many times uh, in a specific order as well. Because if you have wisdom, then you have understanding and you know how to use knowledge. Knowledge without wisdom and understanding is useless. <laughs> And if you have wisdom, but no understanding, I know wise things to say, but I don't know what to do with it, that doesn't do you any good. So we have to have all three. And that forms an acronym in Hebrew. So wisdom is chokhmah, understanding is bina, and knowledge is da'at. There is a ultra-Orthodox rabbinic organization, which ironically is very evangelical. They reach out to Christians to convert them to Judaism, and they reach out to Jews to bring them back into being Torah observant. And that's a group called Chabad. And Chabad is the acronym for Chochma, Bina, and Da'at. Chabad. They're a great group of guys they're, and women. Uh, their rabbis are very well trained. But they're also uh, anti-missionaries. They want to allow Jewish Christians to come back to being Jewish. And I've actually had a Chabad rabbi say to me, 
Jim, you have the neshama of a Jew. You should convert. And I tell him, Rabbi, I don't need to convert. He adopted me as his very own. He made me his son. He called me a people once called Lo Ami, not my people. He now says, I call you uh, B'nai Ha Elohim, sons of the Most High God, sons and daughters. So uh, he wasn't really thrilled with my, my reply. But, but be cautious. They're great guys. You can learn a lot from Chabad, but they will try to convert you. Uh, he is a master of design. And then they also have appointed an assistant, Oholiav, son of Akimash, tribe of Dan. Moreover, I have endowed all the craftsmen wisdom to make everything I have ordered. So these guys were specially gifted as artisans to build all the utensils for, for the, uh, the Mishkan, the mobile temple. <clears throat> and then we jump down to verse 12. Now this is important. Again, I, I want to issue my trigger warning. If you're not used to having your long-held religious and cultural beliefs challenged by God's word, it's time to brace yourself. This is something you need to pray about and come to a heartfelt conviction. The Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel, you are to observe my Shabbaton or my Shabbats, which is Saturday. For this is a sign between you and me through all of your generations. How many generations? All of them. So that you will know that I am the Lord who sets you apart for myself. Therefore, you are to keep my Shabbat, my Sabbath, because it is set apart for you. Everyone who treats it as ordinary, according to the old law, must be put to death. Whoever does any work on it must be cut off from his people. On six days, work will get done, but on the seventh day is a Shabbat. We have, the word in English is Saturday. Uh, for complete rest set apart for Adonai. Whoever does any work on the day of Shabbat must be put to death. Now God's repeating himself. If he repeats himself two or three times, you better pay attention. He's trying to give you a message. The people of Israel are to keep, and the other word in Hebrew is guard, the Sabbath, to observe Shabbat through all their generations as a perpetual covenant. How many generations? All of them. Perpetual means it never ends. It continues all throughout human history. It is a sign between you and me and the people of Israel forever. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. But on the seventh day he stopped working and rested. Did God really need to rest? Did he? No. What is he trying to do? He didn't need to rest. What's he got to rest for? He has all the energy of the universe. He's trying to set an example for humanity. Fascinating that all of the Torah commands, this one is one of the Ten Commandments, and it references a time before the Abrahamic covenant, back before the Noahide covenant, and back into the time of Adam and creation. So it covers all of humanity. Take a mental note. What is God trying to say to you through that comment? Uh, that with the seventh day he stopped working and rested. When he had finished speaking with Moses on the mount, Adonai gave him two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone inscribed by the literal finger of God. So again, a quick comment about the Sabbath. What does Sabbath mean? It's a day of rest. In Hebrew, the, uh, the word it uses after rest is, um, uh, let's see, it's a Shabbat and it's Mikra. Mikra means a holy convocation. What does that mean to us today as Gentile believers? Well, the church historically about 1800 years ago held some councils and they changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. There's no biblical command or biblical uh, opportunity for them to do that, except they want to separate themselves out from the Messianic Jewish believers and from Jewish uh, people as a whole. And so they started worshiping God on Sunday instead of Saturday. They had no biblical command to do that, no biblical authority to change the day of worship. What does that mean to you and I today? Is it a sin for you to go to church on Sunday? Absolutely not. I went to a Messianic synagogue and one of the guys came up to me kind of snarky a little bit and he says, hey, you're a Christian pastor. Why do you worship God on Sunday instead of Saturday when you're supposed to? I said, hey, what makes you think I worship God one day a week? <laughs> I worship him seven days a week. And he's kind of a little sheepish now. And I said, the Sabbath is a day of rest. Now, sometimes I come visit this synagogue on the Sabbath and that's okay. I can worship God seven days a week, but I'm looking around and I said, there's a lot of work going on here at this synagogue today. It doesn't look like rest to me, but maybe it's rest to you. So what is the responsibility? What is the spirit of the Torah in reference to this particular thing? Pray about it. Ask the Lord. You can go to church on Sunday if you want to. What should you do on Saturday? It should be a rest, 
a rest from your daily workload. Spend time seeking the Lord every day, but remember, He has something unique and special, even for us as non-Jewish believers, about the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. Pay attention to it. It's very important to Him. Obviously, in the Old Testament, he was, it was worth killing people, putting people, executing them for violating the Sabbath. So keep that in mind. So, chapter 32 uh, is we, Moses is given the tablets. When the people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain, holy cow, when is he ever going to... Oh yeah, that's the point of what we're getting to. Holy cow. When is he going to come down off this mountain? Come on, Moses. So the people gathered around Aaron, and they said, uh, where is Moses? He's been gone for 40 days. Now if they waited one more day, Moses would have showed up. But they're getting impatient. Rule number one, when you feel impatient, shut up and wait anyway. Wait for the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and walk and not faint. What happened when the people got impatient? They started making their own plans. So they gathered around Aaron and said, get busy. Make us a God. Go ahead. Make us, uh, because Moses, this man, brought us up from the land of Egypt. We don't know what's become of him. He's been gone for 40 days or 39 days. <laughs> And they brought him up from the land of Egypt. We don't know what's become of him. Aaron said to them, Have your wives, sons, and daughters strip off their gold earrings, bring them to me. And the people stripped off their gold earrings, brought them to Aaron. He melted them down and made it in the shape of a golden calf. Why a calf? I have no idea. But a golden calf nonetheless. They said, uh, Israel, here is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. People always want something to put before their eyes. They always want something that they can focus their worship on. We do the same thing today. We're just more subtle about it. Because of this particular problem, most Orthodox Jews will have no even pictures of family members hanging on their walls because they don't want to even come close to making an idol, to making an image, a graven image. They have no crosses. Of course, according to Jewish tradition and custom, the cross is for the Christians. And that's where a Jew hung on a cross, uh, which they, makes no sense to them. So I would just caution you, be careful about having golden calves in your life. Let God speak to you and show you where your golden calf is. You've got him. I guarantee you do. He wants you to remove him. He will not share his glory with anything or anyone. So they said to him, here's your God uh, from the land of Egypt. Aaron built the altar and proclaimed, tomorrow is to be a feast day. Early the next morning, they got up, offered the burnt offerings, presented a peace offering. Afterwards, the people sat down to eat and drink. Then they got up to indulge in revelry. That's a euphemism. <laughs> so they began to worship this golden beast as a god. Sound familiar? So when we come back, we're going to go into further detail on what happened next. So stay tuned and we'll be right back with the holy cow. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, this is Digital Pastor Jim. I want to let you know you can join us on YouTube at the Wild Branch Ministries on YouTube. Every Friday evening, we'll upload the current Torah Zone portion so you can celebrate with us the evening of the Sabbath and follow us on the Torah portion. Have a blessed day today, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with the Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic Roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. All right, welcome back. This, to me, is the pinnacle of this Torah portion. This is the most important principle that we can learn from this portion as non-Jewish believers in a Jewish Messiah. Let's pay attention to this story. Aaron made the calf. 
they began to eat and drink and party and indulge in revelry, which means they were participating in lots of immorality. They worshipped a beast as God. Sound familiar? Look at Book of Revelation. It's coming again. What goes around comes around. Uh, my friend Craig and I talk about this many times in the past, where uh, from a Greco-Roman Greco worldview, we look at prophecy as being a, uh, uh, like a timeline, a contingency. From a Hebraic worldview, prophecy is a circular pattern that repeats itself, almost like a cornucopia, if you will. That's a, a, maybe a bad reference, but it's a, it's a Fibonacci uh, code repeating itself. The pattern repeats itself in a circular pattern and gets stronger and more powerful as time goes by. So what happened in the past will happen in the future. It'll be more extreme, so pay attention. Um, so they, got, they sat down, they eat, uh, and then the Lord said to Moses, go down, hurry, your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, God's kind of mad now, have become corrupt. So quickly they've turned aside from the way I ordered them to follow. Now, the giving of the Ten Commandments is literally the wedding day between a holy God and his people that he's trying to prepare for their wedding. And on the wedding day, the people commit adultery with a foreign God, with a God they made with their own two hands. And so God is not pleased. He does not like sharing his worship with anything or anyone. So, uh, so they began to worship the golden calf. And God says, go down, get your people. They've become corrupt. They forgot what I did just a month and a half ago. They cast a metal statue of a calf, worshipped it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, here is your God who brought you up the land of Egypt. And the Lord continued to speak to Moses. I've been watching these people, and you can see how stiff-necked they are. Now leave me alone so that my anger can blaze against them, and I can put an end to them. God was mad. I will make a great nation out of you instead, Moses. I'll start over. <laughs> So what is Moses' reaction? He begins to plead with the Lord and intercede for these people. And I think that pleases God's heart. When we pray for his mercy, we pray for his grace. For those who are blatantly living in sin. We see that in the story of Noah, and we see that all throughout Scripture. With the story of Abraham, and the story of Lot, and, uh, and Sodom and Gomorrah. They pleaded for mercy from God. Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why must your anger blaze against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians mock you and say, with evil intention, he led them out to slaughter them in the hills and wipe them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce anger. Relent. Don't bring such disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And make, you said you make your descendants as the stars in the sky. And I'll give this land. I've spoken to you about your descendants. And they will possess it forever. The Lord then changed his mind and the disaster he had planned for his people. Now, did God really change his mind? Or was he really just causing an opportunity for Moses to intercede for these people? You can debate with yourself. I believe that God was presenting Moses with an opportunity to intercede, to stand in the gap, to stand between the people who are now rebelling against God and a holy, righteous God. And we see that intercessor develop in Abraham. We see it in Noah. We see it in Moses. We see it all throughout the prophets um, of Israel. And we see it in the final greatest prophet, Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is our great intercessor. And this is the first image of that, or the first early images of that happening. Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets in his hand, inscribed on both sides, front and the back. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved in the tablets. When uh, Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said, Moses, hey, Moshe, it sounds like war in the camp. He answered, that's neither the clamor of victory nor the wailing of defeat. What I hear is the sound of people singing. But the moment Moses got near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and his own anger began to blaze up. He threw down the tablets he'd been holding and shattered them at the base of the mountain. Seizing the calf they had made, he melted it in the fire, ground it into powder, and we scattered it in the water. He made the people of Israel drink it. Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to make you lead them in such a terrible sin? Aaron replied, uh, Don't be so angry. Uh, you know what these people are like. They're determined to do evil. Oh, so that abolishes you from responsibility? No, he'll pay the price later. So they said to me, make us a God so we can bow down and worship him. Where's Moses? So I threw it in the fire, and guess what? A golden calf came out. Who would have thought? 
When Moses saw that the people had gotten out of control because Aaron allowed them to get out of control uh, to the derision of their enemies, Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and shouted, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. All the descendants of the tribe of Levi rallied around him. Now, before this time, they were all supposed to be prophets and priests before the Lord. But because of this sin, the Levites came and rallied around Moses. And he told them, here's the Lord your God of Israel says, each of you put his sword at his side, go up and down the camp of the gate, and every man is to kill his own kinsman, his own friend, and his own neighbor. So the death penalty has been issued. Why? Because they're committing adultery against the Lord himself. And if they're obviously worshiping the golden calf, they have to die today. This is the punishment for that sin. Aren't you glad we're under a new covenant where the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life? The, the old covenant was sin equals death. The new covenant is you have a mediator. You have a chance. You can come in by the blood of Yeshua Jesus and be forgiven of your sins. The old covenant, it was over. Time for the sword. So the sons of Levi did as they did. Uh, 3,000 Israelites died that day. You've consecrated yourselves to the Lord today because every one of you has been against his own son and against his own kinsmen in order to bring a blessing uh, on you yourselves. The next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a terrible sin. Now, uh, now I may be able to atone for your sin. He went back to the Lord. Please, these people have committed a terrible sin. They've made themselves a God out of gold. So again, he's interceding before the Lord. He's standing in the gap between the sinners and between the Most Holy Father. And he says, forgive them their sins, <clears throat> but blot me out of your book if you don't forgive them, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, those who have sinned against me are the ones I will blot out of my book. Now go and lead the people to a place I told you. My angel will go ahead of you. Nevertheless, the time for punishment will come, and I will punish them for their sins. The Lord struck the people with a plague because they'd made a calf out of gold. Now, with Moses grinding up the calf and making them drink it, guess what that parallels to? We'll see it later in Leviticus. It says that when a husband is suspicious that his wife had been cheating on him and was adulterous, one of the things he's supposed to do is take the ashes of the red heifer, mix it in water, and make her drink it. If she drinks it and is fine, his accusations are wrong. and He's got the embarrassment of taking his wife before the entire congregation and accusing her of something she didn't do wrong. But if she did commit adultery, her stomach would blow it up and she would die a terrible death. <laughs> so that's a scary thing. So Moses is actually instituting something that will be later instituted. He's making them drink the ashes of this golden calf that they committed adultery against the Lord. On the wedding day that the Lord was marrying Israel, he was betrothing himself to the nation of Israel, they cheated on him and they worshiped a false god. So the lesson we need to pay attention to in this portion of Scripture is what is the golden calf in your life? Is it your church building? Is it your denomination? Is it your theological perspective that doesn't match up with the Word of God? Is it worshiping God on Sunday instead of Saturday? Is it not making Saturday a day of rest and recognizing God on that day? And you're thinking, well, Pastor Jim, why do I have to obey the Sabbath? That, that passed away with uh, the New Covenant. Oh, really? Which one of the Ten Commandments do you not obey? I bet you obey all of them, except for that one. Why is that important for you to pray about and think about? Because God still calls us to a place of obedience. Salvation is found in faith in Christ alone, no doubt. But when you proclaim faith in Christ, then we have a responsibility of beginning the process of sanctification, of cleaning up our lives of the sin. He doesn't say you can receive salvation and then you can still practice all the horrible sins you've done whether it's adultery, whether it's worshiping false gods, whether it's having golden calves in our lives that we refuse to lay down, whether it's just being selfish and ignorant and stubborn. God wants us to grow as believers. James says in the book of James, you show me someone with faith and no works, I'll show you someone with no faith. So our faith is evidence in what we do. Is, your, is that your salvation? No. Is my salvation in obeying the instructions of God? Absolutely not. But after following and committing my life to him, then I choose to be a servant and follow after him in every way possible. Now, some people choose to eat biblically kosher. If you are in that camp, more power to you. Some people say, I pray over all my food and dedicate it to the Lord, even if it's not biblically kosher. The Apostle Paul tells us, hey, don't argue about such things. To them, it's righteous. To those who think it's unclean, to them it's unclean. Don't argue about such things. Some people celebrate certain holidays. Some people celebrate Christmas and Easter. 
I have questions about those holidays, uh, but others will celebrate the biblical holidays. Do we have to as non-Jewish believers in God, in Jesus? No, but we get to if you want to, and you're missing out on stuff if you're not paying attention. So we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and do a little bit more study in this Torah portion. But pay attention. Let the Lord lead you and guide you in the spirit of the law, not the letter, the spirit. Shalom. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, this is Digital Pastor Jim. I want to let you know you can join us on YouTube at the Wild Branch Ministries on YouTube. Every Friday evening, we'll upload the current Torah Zone portion so you can celebrate with us the evening of the Sabbath and follow us on the Torah portion. Have a blessed day today, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with the Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. Hey, Shalom, welcome back. Now we're going to wrap up this Torah portion. We didn't get to go through the whole thing, but I think the most important part that we realize is that God has specific things He wants us to do as His people. He doesn't just say we get to do whatever we want. He wants us to, uh, to stay focused. He wants us to intercede, just like Moses did for the Israelites when they sinned. And we see that on this day of the golden calf, 3,000 Israelites died. Now this day traditionally was uh, 50 days, from Passover. So 50 days later is, in Greek, it's Pentecost. Oh, wait, that word's familiar. In Hebrew, it's Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. They were to wait 50 days between Passover uh, and Pentecost, or Shavuot. Now, what happens is 3,000 Israelites died here. 1,500 years later, after this event, Jesus was crucified on the cross. He was buried and resurrected. He's meeting with his disciples, and he says, tarry in Jerusalem. Pentecost is one of three holidays that they're required to go to, to make Aliyah to go up to Jerusalem. And, uh, and so they go back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Shavuot. In English and in Greek, we call it Pentecost. So what happened after the disciples got together? It says they came together in the upper room of the great house. Some people interpret that as the, actually the temple. And what happened? Now on Mount Sinai, there was cloven tongues of fire. Everyone heard God speak the Torah in their own language, which means they all heard foreign tongues. And, uh, and God poured out his spirit. He wanted to marry the Israelites, but they worshiped a golden calf, 3,000 died. 1,500 years later, the, the Israelites are gathered together once again, the Jews in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, and God does something new. He pours out His Spirit on all flesh. The disciples begin to prophesy. There's cloven tongues of fire, peals of thunder. People hear them in their own individual languages from all the nations that they came from, and the glory and the representation of Jesus as Messiah was poured out. Then 3,000 were saved. Do you see the significance? Under the old covenant, 3,000 died. Under the new covenant, 3,000 were saved. They were redeemed. And now the gospel begins to go out. The first big debate in the early church is, what do we do about these Gentiles, these proselytes? And that's what we discuss later when we get to a study later on in the book of Acts um, and what happens there. But the important lesson for us today to keep in mind is the old covenant ended in death. The law of sin equals death is done away with because Yeshua took the place of Moses, and he is our intercessor. He intercedes with us before the Father so that the punishment of our sin is eventually death. Our physical bodies will die, and then eternal death if we don't repent. But if we make repentance, if we turn from our wicked ways, 
and begin to worship the Lord God. Set aside our golden calves, our golden idols in our lives. Get rid of that holy cow and begin to worship the Lord with our whole hearts. For some of you, it may be something um, that you own. It may be a principle that you follow. Let go of the things that stand between you and worshiping the Lord and turn your heart to Him fully. So we just want to stop and just close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the truth of your scriptures, that the gospel is preached throughout all books of the Bible. If we pay attention and look closely, we can see the Spirit guiding us to a place of repentance and a place of salvation through the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. So, Father, we repent of our sins. We pray you'd help us to destroy the golden calves in our lives and worship you and you alone. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach. And what that means in Hebrew is, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Have a blessed day, my friends, and join us next week on The Torah Zone. If you have a prayer request or have any questions, contact Digital Pastor Jim at 719-243-0996. That phone number again is 719-243-0996. Or text him at that number. Or email us at the Wild Branch Ministries at gmail.com. Your tax deductible donations to these ministries are greatly appreciated.